Um, that's uh, right about time uh, when I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And this is going to be Jari Pekka Kaliva. Uh, hello, how are you today? I'm fine and thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, we're happy to have you. How is your summer going? Yeah, uh, just starting still, waiting for the holiday season to start for me. Uh, how long is it going to be? Oh, well, I mean, I'm based in Finland, so it will going to be full four weeks. So enjoying the Scandinavian uh, working culture. Oh, uh, well, I'm yeah, break. exactly. I'm always jealous about how you uh, have these proper summer holidays in Finland. Yeah. It's amazing. I think we should all look at it and maybe copy. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Before you do that, let's work a little bit. It's uh, yep. uh, over to you. We are going to enjoy your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I'm Rebecca Kaleva, Managing Director of the European Games Developer Federation. And today I'm going to give you a very short and hands-on uh, presentation on upcoming changes in the European copyright and consumer protection law. This really sounds like an extremely boring topic, but it's something that is going to be in your on your table during the next six months uh, if you are based in Europe and in many cases also for the companies that are operating inside the EU um, from, the out, from the third countries like Russia. So definitely something to be at least aware of and if necessary to take action. So EGDF uh, unites 18 trade associations uh, that represent altogether more than 2,500 game developer studio that employ over 40,000 people. And what we basically do is representing game developers in Brussels. And uh, we have been actively lobbying uh, both of these uh, files, uh, copyright and consumer protection files, for years now. And now we are living the exciting times when they are finally entering into force. So let's start with a uh, new European directive on copyright and digital single market that was supposed to enter into force in all EU countries at yesterday. But then COVID happened. Um, these rules are going to be entering into force uh, step by step in different EU member states uh, during the autumn 2021 and spring 2022 because there has been significant delays in the national implementation. But uh, in basic, but basically it means that uh, uh, these rules will be implemented uh, different. Uh, phases in the different countries, which means that for the next year, the copyright framework in the EU is a bit fragmented. But uh, if you are following these rules already from the beginning, that's of course even better because then uh, you will be on the safe side. So what's going to happen? Uh, there are lots of lots of uh, different uh, things that copyright rules are going to change, but I will focus on the ones that are most uh, important for the game developer studios. The first thing are new on liabilities for online content sharing services um, like YouTube and Twitch, etc., who have to be able to uh, demonstrate that they are have made their best efforts to obtain an authorization. Uh, from the right holders for the, any content shared on their platforms. And of course, uh, if a right holder notifies them that they want to take the content down, they have to un ensure the unavailability of the, these works and uh, act uh, to disable access to them or remove them. Uh, this is a, somewhat a challenge from the game industry perspective because, of course, if you are working for film industry, that's what you want to do. You want to uh, secure that your content is not shared without uh, you getting a fair remuneration of that, of course. And uh, but in the game industry side, number of companies rely on uh, viral and influencer marketing, and now. These rules also uh, apply to the social media influencers streaming your gameplay or any player wanting to share how fun it is to play your game through YouTube or with Twitch. And basically, what you should do now is to find a way. It can be a uh, license, so like open source license or something like that. It can be a specific permit on your terms and conditions on your website. 
to allow players to share your con their content on these platforms, or you just can tolerate it without taking any action. But in any case, you should take some kind of action to authorize players to stream themselves playing your game. And the big unknown part of this is how the big streaming platforms are going to implement these new rules. Some of them might be building some kind of tools where you have to specifically authorize this. Some are just uh, going to act uh, when uh, uh, they are notified uh, about uh, content uh, that is uh, not available. And that content that is uh, should be made unavailable uh, as requested by right holders. But we don't know yet exactly how Twitch or YouTube are going to, for for example, how they are going to implement these new rules. But in any case, uh, this is something that uh, you should prepare now on your, your side on how you are going to, in the simplest way possible, enable and authorize uh, sharing of your content uh, uh, through these streaming platforms if you want to do so. Of course, there might be some game developer studios who want to block the uh, Let's Play videos, for example, because they are making narrative storytelling games and they don't want to see their games to be spoiled by someone streaming their content uh, to the YouTube. So it's up to you to decide. Take action if needed. Uh, then there are some things that you have to be aware of. Uh, something that many uh, people are really worried about uh, is the new right for authors and some meaning some employees to claim additional appropriate and fair remuneration when the original remuneration turns out to be this uh, proportionally low and this really sounds a bit scary for anyone running a business but these kind of rules have already existed, existed in germany or finland for years and they have been really re very rarely used so I wouldn't really overestimate their impact. Of course, there will be some cases when there is a, some kind of a big um, fight between the author and the developer studio when this kind of uh, rights might be on your table. But otherwise, uh, it's unlikely to have a major impact. Uh, the right for a revocation. Uh, so in case you have uh, access to certain work, let's say a book IP or film IP, and you are not really uh, doing anything to make a game about that, those authors will have a right to revoke uh, the license or the transfer of rights in that case. So something to be aware of. But then the main new thing. So uh, the new transparency obligation means that authors and performers be on a regular basis, at least once a year, information on exploitation of their works and performances from the parties whom to, uh, to who they have licensed or transferred their rights. In particular, regarding the modes of ex exploitations, uh, revenues uh, generated, and so on. And this is going to be a major HR burden for a number of game developer studios. Because first of all, you have to identify who is making artistic contributions in your game. Um, so you have to start tracking people who are actively participating in the game creation process. And uh, of course, in a big AAA productions, this can be hundreds of people. This will be much easier, of course, in the smaller studios. Then the far more challenging part is to identify these power uh, in most countries, this would at least mean uh, anyone doing music in the games, uh, uh, anyone uh, writing a text or making arts, uh, as long as those contributions are significant. So if there is just an intern doing one single piece item in there, in most countries, that uh, wouldn't count in as a significant contribution. Then it's a good question about, uh, uh, let's say, creative directors, art directors, and their role. But anyway, this is something you have to identify. Who are the authors who you are going to report uh, the information about how their work has been exploited? And it's important to keep in mind that you have to continue this reporting most likely after they might have left the company. So this is uh, uh, going to be... Uh, 
rather tricky HR process uh, that has to be tackled during uh, next six months so in most EU countries. And uh, of course, this is something that uh, happens inside the studio. So most likely, uh, uh, if you don't have any kind of uh, entities inside the EU, uh, these uh, things will not be so much on your table. Whereas uh, for the uh, authorizing uh, this kind of uh, video streaming of your gameplay for the players is something that also the companies located outside Europe have to do for the European players. So that was the first part about the copyright uh, directive. So basically update your HR system. And uh, uh, hopefully we are going to see some kind of new tools emerging for this task during the next months. So then there are going to be significant changes on the consumer protection rules in the beginning of 2022. Um, the first one will be the new directive on the contracts for the supply of digital content. And the second one will be the better enforcement of the consumer protection rules in May. And these are directives that are not that much delayed, so most likely this will happen in time. So a new directive on the contracts of the digital content services. First of all, if you are an amateur developer uh, who doesn't want to fall under the consumer protection rules, and even if your game is free, you have to provide it uh, in the future under an open source license, because that's the way to avoid being under the scope of the new consumer protection rules. And uh, one of the new things is that all the games have to be of description, quantity, quality, and possess the functionality, compatibility, interoperability, and other features, which consumer might reasonably expect taking into account any information uh, that is given to them before they download or purchase the game. So basically this means that if you are going to make drastic changes in your game series, for example, and introduce new business models or really change the game in a fundamental manner, it is something that uh, you should be very carefully communicating to the game developers, because otherwise uh, they will be allowed to uh, uh, ask their money back. Second in uh, it, um, uh, to, to have to make uh, consumer available to have to make consumable available any content or personal data which they have provided uh, or created so any user created generated content uh, that has some can be used outside the game uh, so in game scenarios, it is, uh, is most likely not going to apply so much. Uh, there might be some discussions about uh, save files. So those be able, should players be able to download them for continuing playing and when they reinstall the game. But otherwise, uh, that is not going to have a major impact. What is going to be really important are the, the, is the fact that contracts have to specifically allow major modification of digital content. So if you are running games as a service or uh, free to play the game, you have to, first of all, write in your terms and conditions that the game will change drastically over time. And consumers have to be informed beforehand uh, about these modifications. So if you are changing the game's balance really significantly, this is information that uh, players should receive uh, beforehand in the future. And in some countries, there will be new uh, rights for uh, traders to pursue remedies from the persons liable in the value chain. So, for example, if the problems are actually caused by Apple and Google, you might have a right to uh, ask for, for them to cover the cost uh, or uh, take care of the challenges caused by them. But unfortunately, this part is not implemented in all EU member states. So, it's a bit country by country question. So. So some countries, uh, you have actually a little bit stronger position against the platforms in the future because of the consumer protection rules. And the, of course, the problem for the game developer studios is that the big platforms are pushing all the consumer support burden to, in the hands of game developers uh, from their hands. So um, hopefully this kind of process will be, at least in some European countries, a little bit um, 
hindered uh, because of the rules. So, and quite important now to react really on this that there is going to be a second directive as well on the better enforcement of consumer protection rules. And there will be GDPR like fines, uh, at least 4% of the traders' annual turnover in the member states where you are breaking the consumer protection rules. And uh, this is uh, something that will be enforced uh, uh, much more strongly than before, because there will be also a right for consumer rights associations to make cross border uh, uh, injunctions uh, in the courts. Uh, against Game Over Studios if they uh, feel that they are not following the uh, consumer protection rules. So from 2022 forward, so let's say uh, 2020, end of 2023, uh, there will, will be much stronger enforcement framework from the European game, uh, European consumer protection rules. And that also has an impact on the games industry. And also on the directive of enforcement of consumer protection rules, there's a specific uh, article saying that you have to clearly inform when the price presented uh, is personalized on a basis of automated decision. So something extra to add to your terms and conditions if you are doing something like that. Uh, Ten platforms uh, have to provide general information on the main parameters in terms of the ranking of product, also for players. But uh, there will be much more detailed information available for any game developer studios under the platform regulation. So when you see this kind of uh, information about rankings that is targeted for players, be, please be aware of the fact that there will be much more detailed information available for businesses somewhere in the platforms. And the last thing that uh, might have impact on the uh, uh, games industry are the false uh, uh, is the fact that fast consumer reviews on social endorsements are listed as unfair commercial practices. It's still uh, the main focus of this article is on um, false uh, consumer reviews done by other traders, uh, um, done by traders to boost their services. So that is clearly unfair practice. But there is also discussions going on at the moment about how this kind of the, how this kind of false reviews done by players who haven't actually been playing your game that are just trolling you by really low uh, star rankings and saying that your game sucks uh, how, should also those be banned and this is a bit of ongoing discussion on how far does this new article go but hopefully there will be also means for play, uh, game developer studios to address false reviews done by players who haven't actually played the game so, what to do? Uh, first thing, during the next autumn, it's time to review your terms and conditions and do the necessary changes there so that you are in line with the consumer protection rules. And be careful with building the hype because any game you are doing, the hype is going to be seen from the consumer protection perspective as a promise. So if you are promising that the game has a certain feature, it should be there or the players have a right to ask uh, uh, some kind of uh, ask their money back or ask you to fix or provide that fee. You have promised that. So, of course, if you make a statement that, okay, we have to cancel these features or something like that, then it's fair deal for the consumers, but you have to make that statement. So, in practice, this means that when you have someone making public presentations about the features in a game, pay attention to what you are promising. And as I said, as uh, new consumer protection rules will be enforced uh, much more uh, stronger manner uh, during the 2020, later part of 2022 and beginning of 2023, it's uh, good to check that your game uh, is in line with the latest European consumer protection standards. For example, pre-contractual information uh, on... Uh, how big your game is as a file on this kind of details, uh, transparency of the odds if you're using loot boxes, uh, the fact that you have uh, player support uh, for the players who want to contact you, and so on. So all these things uh, should be in line. So it's a good opportunity to really update uh, your uh, consumer protection uh, practices and player support practices now, because well, 
you have to in any way start now reviewing your terms and conditions. So why not to do go a bit further and really secure that you are in line with the EU rules. That of course apply to all companies doing business in the EU. So I think I'm now uh, reached the end of my presentation. Are there any questions from the audience at the moment? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I think uh, we'll have to re-watch it a couple of times to understand uh, everything and to analyze all the uh, insights that you provided. Uh, mm -hmm. I have uh, one question for you. So you have talked a lot about the short-term impacts on uh, of these changes, but um, what kind of impact these changes are going to have on the European video game markets on the long run, in your opinion? Uh, that's it's, uh, absolutely true that uh, on the short run, uh, because of the new consumer, let's start from the copyright rules. So because of the new copyright rules, uh, on the short run, there will be this kind of HR uh, uh, challenges emerging and you have to build up new systems. But on the long run, uh, there will be this kind of um, moment when the big publishers are going to be asking like, how are you going to be able to pro provide this kind of in environment uh, where if uh, uh, your game is successful, uh, there will not be any additional claims emerging from the employees for the extra remuneration. And of course, uh, it means that there has to be some kind of new models of uh, um, uh, play in employee in employer engage employee engagement like uh, providing a bonus clear bonuses uh, or some kind of um, let's say stock options or something like that so that they are also benefiting from the success to, success of the game from the beginning and this uh, kind of because then they don't have to right to use uh, that new rights of uh, really re uh, renegotiating to um, contracts they had before so this will most likely change a bit of on the long run this kind of uh, employee engagement practices on uh, yeah that might, it's interesting to see how it rolls out on the other hand it also might be that uh, because of this kind of this regulatory answer on the european side uh, some people will have a look on Eastern Europe as a place to do outsourcing or create content because uh, at the moment uh, the regulatory environment might be a bit clearer in those countries for the time being, at least. All right. On the yeah, and if, uh, on the consumer protection side, yeah, it's clearly uh, before games were wild, wild west. Now we are entering the time when. It's not only more just GDPR and data protection, it's also the consumer protection topics you have to really be aware of. So there is much more things to really pay attention to also on the consumer protection side that you have to be aware of. And yeah, players are better secured. Well, players uh, definitely are, but it's getting more and more difficult for game developers uh, to deliver mm. great product and uh, to find their audience. And uh, well, I don't think it will stop anyone from making games anyways. <laughs> yeah, like uh, if you have a look on the uh, regulatory framework in uh, some of the European countries, uh, if I would see it on my table, I would say, yeah, I really cannot make games in this kind of environment, but in the end, uh, you just find your ways to do it. And quite often uh, it's these kind of regulatory risks are perhaps a little bit overestimated so yeah if you have a great game your employees are happy and your players are happy most likely you won't have any problems that that's true and uh, we should not forget that making games is not only a business it's also the passion that you know mm. many people cannot uh cannot avoid let's say and i've seen many many developers over the years that uh, are still trying to create a successful product they keep failing but they do not stop trying and i'm very i'm pretty sure that one day they will succeed and uh, um, actually um, we are going to have uh, a sponsor 
at the offline edition of the Dublin conference next week that once or like a couple of times uh, took part in the developer exhibition that we also always host. So they joined the conference as a small indie team and mm -hmm. now they're, you know, uh, big fat sponsors. Uh, and uh, it's so pleasant to see that, you know, companies can reach such success. No matter what. And it, and it also demonstrates how important it is to pay attention to these kind of things on, from the outside. Because one day you are a small company, but the next day you might exactly. be actually extremely successful and uh, reinventing the ways you are running your business, uh, running your HR system, or how you are uh, protecting players from the data protection or consumer protection perspective is very difficult at the moment when you have a successful game in your hands. But if you that have done your lessons uh, well, and you are prolonging the rules from the outset, yeah, it's not a problem. That, that's true. And I think it's like everywhere, it's uh, all about uh, finding the balance between, I mean, yeah. if you are a small team, you cannot afford, you know, like a big law, law firm and like think about all the regulations, but still you should keep in mind that, yeah, I mean, you are doing that because you want to become a big company with uh, mm -hmm. successful games and then it might, you know, come back and bite you. Uh, so better think about it uh, from the very beginning. I think uh, those developers can use your presentation, you know, to um, take care of uh, most of the stuff. So thank you once again for the insightful talk and uh, for the opening of the conference. Have yeah, a nice thank day. You so much. Yeah. <laughs> you as well. And congratulations for running one of the first on site uh, games conferences in Europe. Yeah. So yeah. We, we, we will try. Yeah. Thank you. And hopefully yeah. that uh, very soon you'll be able to come to St. Petersburg, which is super close to Finland. And exactly. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I haven't been there for years. So happy to come. Thank you so yeah. much and have a great conference. You too. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great day.